community engagement on topics that we think are important and that we care a lot about. Uh, so tonight you're gonna to hear from Sean and, and Lee uh, talking about landscaping and in sort of connecting to the natural world and, and that whole spirit. I wanna emphasize that this was supported by Stephen Brenda Olson in the courtyard by Marriott. And um, just a little bit on the topic, many people don't know this, but when I, uh, I work way, my way through college, I had my own landscaping company. So I had a dump truck, a trailer, a York rake, a backhoe, and a, and a tractor, and I went around and I paid my private tuition for college. So it's a great, and I love doing it because you could make something beautiful. Uh, on a more serious note, um, and I think they'll be reinforcing this, uh, we underestimate how much the landscape, what we see around us, influences us, makes us happier, makes us feel better. Uh, there's, it's no accident. If you go to Europe and you look at all the old hospitals, Inside the courtyards of hospitals, uh, most of them have really beautiful gardens. And long after that, there's been research to show that just being in that environment actually makes a physiological difference. Um, so thanks a lot for coming and talking. The format is they'll give a lecture. We'll have time for 10 minutes or so of questions. Then we go out and there's drinks, refreshments, special artistic activities and conversation. So thank you very much, and I look forward to, I'm probably gonna change careers again. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you for being here. We're so glad to see you. We want you to know that each and every one of you belong here and that each and every one of you matter. And we're gonna tell you why in just a little bit. But first, we're not here to bang our fists or use language like we need or we must or predict inevitable scary possibilities. We've had enough of that. I've had enough of that. <clears throat> we, we know there are needs and musts and we know this because it comes from within, not from others, not from climate scientists and not from governments. We can see, hear, and feel the symptoms of a world unbalanced and responding. These messages overburden us and diminish us. They diminish our ability to function much of the time. And this is on. Thank you. Our role is to share with you what has been working and not working for us so that you might begin to try, fail, try again, until you find a purpose that pulls you forward. We're here to pull the curtains of distraction away and illuminate the simple, crucial, and undeniab undeniable reality of living systems. So simple that the reminder is in your every breath. Most importantly, we want to remind you that you belong that you matter, and that when each of us find our own personal belonging, we'll see how much we matter to the whole of this living world. And together, we can change our behaviors and be in support of the continuation of life. Take a breath. Hold it. Right now, your body is receiving oxygen that it will store and use. And when you're ready to let go, what you're releasing is carbon dioxide. Imagine that carbon dioxide floating to the tree right outside the door. That tree receives that CO2 and sunlight making sugars and oxygen, which make food for us and many other organisms. Natural systems really aren't all that complex when we break it down. For about three billion years, Earth systems have been functioning on a capture, store, use, waste, repeat cycle. Let's think of this as receiving, embodying, nourishing, and passing it on, a feedback loop that can renew, renew a multitude of systems. It's this process that makes our living construct work. We want to make sure that we're all receiving this, so let's look at photosynthesis to start. 
That process of plants receiving CO2 and sunlight, making sugars and oxygens, driving the food, wood, food web, all of which can be cycled and eventually move toward the unsung he heroes of the energy cycle, the decomposers, like fungi and the soil food web. For a moment here, we're going to play a game. Can it be received by the Earth? Lee, you look dashing this evening. So colorful. Would you say that the majority of your outfit could at least be received by the Earth again if you needed to bury it? I'm going to say most of it will go back to the Earth quite easily. I'm feeling the outfit that I'm wearing, and it feels like there might be a little bit of plastic in it, Ooh. a little poly. I mean, it's a fabulous shirt. I mean, so let's just hold on to that. But so to give you an idea that this, this clipboard right here, made of materials that can decompose, oops, oh my gosh, what did I just do? <laughs> that was a mistake. So sorry. Can fix it before we decompose. I'm going to fix it. There it is. It's back. Let's not do that again. Oh, gosh. Please forgive me. We're getting there. Gosh. What a way to ruin the show, Sean. We didn't rehearse this part. <laughs> yeah, can we get a round of applause there? All right. <laughs> We're not going to touch that. No. I think we got the point. All right. Like this, this mug that I'm carrying right here. That one. Now, I can reuse this over and over and over again, but it can never, ever, ever really be received by the earth again. And we're going to get to some points in just a minute here. I'm going to let this one go. Thanks for your patience. Our landscapes and lifestyles are unquestionably and inescapably intertwined. Everything we do has an impact, a currency, an exchange. But at what cost? Humanity has been taking without reciprocation for too long. Perhaps we could be more conscious of everything. To why we want, to what we buy, to where we build, and to how we consume. We are a process, not a product. Everything is a process. Until we slow it down and lock it up into a product that cannot be received by the Earth. Everything in the universe is made up of energy. Everything has a vibration. Matter is energy that has been slowed down. Our world is filled with energy that has been slowed down and trapped into forms that can disrupt and poison the natural cycles from which we exist. Let's look at plastic, for example. This phone, plastic, glass, metal, a whole bunch of stuff here. I can certainly capture with my phone. I can use it. I can store with it. I can certainly pass things on with it. But I cannot, receive, I cannot return that to the Earth. Now, metal has a really high embodied energy that requires more energy and re extracted resources to change it. Most of it not so returnable. My bracelet. And then there's concrete. Sorry. It's embodied energy created from materials extracted from the land and then transformed into something that will eventually crumble. How can it be used again and how many times? Either way, the extractive cost is high. Fundamental mechanisms and processes evolved a very long time ago that are extremely sensitive to disruption. By polluting our atmosphere, soils, and oceans, we continually disrupt these mechanisms, processes, and pathways. It's time for humanity to reintegrate, to balance out the scale of giving and taking, and support a truly regenerative future. Alignment is the key to being the change we want to see in the world. At our landscape design studio, we are always asking ourselves in our process, can it be received by the earth in an, in an effort to emphasize a closed loop model of design. As mentioned previously, we encounter everyday materials that cannot be returned but the, to the earth. So how do we, the whole of humanity, change our minds about waste before it ends up in a landfill, which much of what we create often does? As humans, we want, we buy, and we consume. But what if we started focusing on what can be received by the Earth? This requires making the unfamiliar familiar. This is a project that we have in Hollywood, California. Um, the clients came to us. They said, we really want a native garden. We went to the Theodore Payne Foundation. We love native plants. Can you, can you uh, design a native garden? Absolutely. That's what we specialize in. But as I got to this um, property and saw this pink and purple house, I knew that these were our clients because they were so fabulous. There was so much opportunity 
that we couldn't pass up, such as rainwater harvesting, materials reuse, uh, soil, uh, building the soil uh, profile, and we'll get into some other practices you'll see here in a moment, that we really started to promote the idea of a more regenerative approach. Of course, they were super interested in seeing how far we could take this, and we took it far. During demolition, any sane practical contractor would come in, rip this up, and haul it off, but not our team. Through creative saw cutting, the organization and recomposition of everything you see here, even the dead plant material, we can transform any space from lifeless and impacted to a place that invites, embraces, and supports an abundance of life. This shift in behavior has a profound ripple effect that emanates from our clients outward. Their lives are filled with immense pride and joy from trying something so bold embodying that change we've been talking about. So this one we're going to show you speaks to the human desire for approval and also bravery, truly bravery, for doing things differently. We have a dear friend. She had a dreadful problem with water from an adjacent property flooding her home, her basement, her garden, and carrying her topsoil away. She hired a landscaper, paid a lot of money for a garden that didn't do anything to stop that problem. So enter Studio Petricor and Rue, changing the surface plane, bringing that water, that flow through the garden, using uh, contouring the surface so that we capture that water and put it into the ground where it belongs. We can move it all the way through that garden through a bioswale and a living system there. This continues to grow and get more beautiful all the time. Our client reported that she'd lived there for 22 years and once this garden went in, she had her first cottontail rabbit hop through. We also wanted to bring water off the roof and into the backyard and also to bring water from the backyard roof out into the front. So we needed to cut into that concrete driveway in order to lay pipe. But that made it a permeable driveway, capturing more water and getting that back into the earth. And we built a cistern, put in a cistern, and we used that concrete we cut out of the driveway to build these urbanite retaining walls, steps, and create a shifting surface plane here that captures water in a natural way. Water is stored in this area when it, when it rains, and we also capture it in these cisterns. At this point, our client had a problem. Oh no, what are my neighbors going to think about these cisterns? And as she now has water, not only for herself throughout the year, but for the fire department, if they need it, they can access this water. She's now considered a very wise woman. It's been transformational for her, for her space, for the abundant life that now surrounds her. Our clients invest in gardens that restore natural cycles and living systems that proliferate life, rather than ones that interrupt and diminish life. She has now moved her office from the front of her house into her kitchen nook where she can observe this garden at all times throughout the day. So making the unfamiliar familiar takes bravery, tenacity, and trust. And when we embrace nature as a who, how, and what we are, we embody the change that would support humanity right now. Imagine with me a world where we looked at discards or materials around us and found a better, more creative use for them to slow down that desire for new, which requires more extraction, more disruption, and the creation of more and more discards. These disruptions have been and continue to impact all life. So now, can you see our mission clearly? We want to interrupt that waste stream. What is that mission? That mission is life, the continuation of life. So how can we embody that mission and not cheat a system that has been in place for eons?
consider that life begins with a single drop of rain. And yet, right now, our relationship to that drop is really messed up. So I'm going to ask you to go on a brief meditative journey with me. If you feel comfortable, close your eyes. And I want you to relax and think about our incredible coastal sage foothills all around us. The smells, those scents, the feels, the crunch underfoot, the animals running around. Let's take a brief hike and find a spot that you know or love or would like to know. Is there shade there? Is it riparian? Is it dry? What's it like? Find a shady spot and sit down. Take those plants, crush those leaves, and smell them. If you're wearing a mask, put a piece of that white sage in your mask. It's not only antiseptic, it smells like heaven. Now listen, do you hear insects? Oh, it's a super bloom, can you smell that? All those flowers, all that color, all that beauty right there on those hillsides, unwatered, untended, and uncared for by a gardener. It's beautiful, it's natural, it is our California foothills, and it's right here. But we can't stay there. We always have to go back, don't we? And when we go back, after taking that time out of our lives for hikes and camping and being immersed in nature, communing, healing, connecting, we then we return home to a landscape that needs to be kept on life support. Imagine with me. It's raining and you're a drop of rain. Splash, you hit the pavement. Cars are racing by, polluting the water with emissions, brake dust, and so much more. You are now water and poison. You're making your way down with your fellow raindrops down a gutter when suddenly you fall from the road into a hole, into a garden, a rain garden, where the soil has been nurtured and optimized. It has been optimized. It has been nurtured in love. And as you begin to move through the soil, the life, the microbes, the fungi, the plant roots are all thanking you for being there. They're cleansing you of the poison you've collected. You've been purified. And as a drop of rain, the plant roots gulp you up, receive you, embody you. They are nourished by you so that they can capture and store carbon dioxide. That's important, right? They create sugars and oxygens to pass on that support, that in turn support biodiversity, which is community above and below ground to which we all belong. Until finally on a warm sunny day, they pass you on back to the atmosphere. So our team's big mission is to inspire a global paradigm shift by influencing humanity's reintegration with nature. More specifically, to reconnect humanity to our impact. Starting with that drop of rain, acknowledging where it came from, what it's been through, and how we can honor it. So I invite you to the LA County Arboretum, to the Crescent Farm. This is one acre that for 80 years was a lawn. And it was used by nothing but the wildlife there. And not such wildlife when you only have a lawn. There they are, peacocks from India. There's our wildlife using that lawn. You didn't see people there. You didn't see kids running across it. You saw mowers, edgers, blowers, sprinklers, chemicals to keep it alive on life support because the more you grow grass, the more and use chemicals on it, the more the soil structure is destroyed. And it needs more chemicals. That's life support, water from five states away to keep that lawn going. But if you take that lawn out 
and you use that material as biomass, and you change the surface plane of that one acre, and you reduce its water use by 97%, and you create water harvesting features, starting with wildflowers that begin to remediate the soil, put nitrogen, natural nitrogen, back into the soil. You can have a flourishing scene like that in less than a year. In fact, in three months. Those plants bring in 37 species, documented species of native bees that are not seen elsewhere in the Arboretum. Six hundred, uh, 27 acres and this acre has the wildlife in it. So where there's carbon in the soil, there's water. And where there's water in the soil, there's life. And without soil life, we're lost. I'd like to draw your attention to some of the features here. You're seeing uh, a various uh, lawn substitutes, native grasses, uh, bioswale, an arid climate orchard, a uh, bioswale and infiltration basin that puts water back in the ground where it belongs. This brings water in off the street, often from running sprinklers, and that water is diverted into here and put back in the ground rather than running off and being sent to the ocean. Here we have uh, a surface plane, a berm here at the back, a mound. We use as much biomass as we can to put carbon back into the soil, and that soil responds with an abundant growth. To the back here is a berm that has native plants on it that has never been watered, that has grown into a hedgerow that is sponsored by the Xerces Foundation because of all the insects and birds that live there. And in front of it is a meadow year round. My favorite moment at this meadow was a woman standing at that end and saying, I don't know where I am. No, it's not the Huntington. No, I know you don't feel good, but you need to come here. I, I'm not sure where I am. Oh, I know. And she hit the button on the phone so that her friend at home not feeling well could see the garden in front of her. And she said, yes, yes, I'll drop a pin. You can find your way here. You're going to feel a lot better. And I don't know what happened. I know I felt a lot better just hearing that, knowing when we go here, we see butterflies, we see birds, we see abundant life with 97% less use of water. So here we are live, nurturing living soil. We're supporting carbon sequestration. We have active and passive water harvesting through our land contouring. We increase biodiversity and habitat. We educate and empower communities. This has spread throughout the community with people coming in to learn in this garden and taking it home and doing it at their own homes. And we change people's perception of beauty rather than a lawn with a straight sidewalk and loaf of bread shaped hedges, we have something that's alive, diverse, moving, using fewer resources and supporting more biodiversity. So historically, form follows function. It, and that's defined as the shape of a building an object or space primarily relating to its intended function or purpose. So what is the function we are relating our designs to? To meet the needs and desires of human activity? Is it purely an aesthetic ideal? Function is a word that represents energy, flow, movement. Our focus is on the function of the landscape systems that guide how we design with nature. This is called co-creation. In other words, humanity reaps the benefits when we put nature first. So the water shortage has always been here. 
we've known about it for decades, and yet most of us chose to continue with business as usual. I get it. Changing is rough. Now that the media and the governments are strongly recommended, are recommending, as well as enforcing restrictions well after dropping to historic lows, everybody's scrambling. Many of us knew and heard and chose to ignore the signs. The most basic element, just after oxygen, that our bodies require for survival has been threatened for a very long time. OK, is the answer to scramble, grab for resources in a state of emergency, to rip out lawns and just stop watering? When has drama or overreaction ever really served us? There is no quick solution to fixing this. However, one thing we can do is slow the heck down. Breathe, listen. How many in this room meditate? Well, you may think that might be a little too woo-woo for you, but seriously, relationships to the land invite us to listen, to observe, and to question. Emergency, crisis, and bad are just a few of the words that we're reacting to, and many of us are shutting down. So it's time to redefine the game. You never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the old model obsolete. Thank, Thank you, you Bucky. Bucky. Folks are always asking us, how do we take this change to the citywide level? Great question, and we are working on that as we speak. However, for us, designing these supportive interconnected systems are easy for us because we've been out there doing, trying, failing, and trying again, and then succeeding and learning for a while now. So our biggest hurdle is an underlying core issue, which I'll get to in just a moment. But first, before we get there, I want to take you on a journey through the city of Burbank. Or better yet, a green waste journey. So the businesses, residences, and governments of the city of Burbank collectively produce 18,000 tons of landscape clippings per year. The city of Bur um, the landscape clippings include, you know, lawn trimmings, tree trimmings, uh, food waste, and all the stuff that goes into the green bin. And yeah, people even put other trash in there as well that has to be sorted and sifted out. All of this is packed into the green bins, which are collected by these packer trucks. So those packer trucks deliver the, those loads of green waste to the recycling center in Burbank, where all of this is packed onto semi-trucks and hauled over the grapevine to Lamont. Now, just a little bit of uh, information on this. That's 900 loads at 21, uh, 21 tons per truck, 180,000 miles driven per year, 2,880 hours spent each year, and over 27,000 gallons of fuel used each year, creating 562,000 plus pounds of CO2 emissions per year. That's 95 miles each way that those trucks have to deliver the green waste to Le Mans. So let's add on those Packer trucks. That's an additional 20, 247,000 pounds of CO2 per year. And just for the heck of it, let's add mow and blow maintenance, an additional 881,000 pounds of CO2 per year. year. The organic discards are moved 17 times before they return to the soil. And the city loses the potential of 100,000 pounds of nutrients and soil amendments increasing water holding capacity per year. And I mean, couldn't all of our landscapes benefit from this so-called waste? And this is just the city of Burbank. One city. So the city of Pasadena's Water and Power Division engaged us to demonstrate waste transformation. We are big on interrupting the waste stream. They want us to demonstrate waste transformation to reimagine water conservation. What they weren't expecting was a game changer. Sean mentioned optimization earlier. This truly represents the and in our work, and it embodies transforming our relationship to waste, which is really messed up. For this collaboration, we are embracing simple techniques to transform green waste and other organic discards. Would normally be sent to a landfill, and we use those to teach communities ways to thoughtfully create beautiful, resilient, biodiverse gardens. 
What did we say to the city of Pasadena? Of course, yes, and may we demonstrate a whole systems approach to our design? Listen, this practice of building and optimizing landscapes through waste transformation is accessible, effective, and it's really fun to do with your community. Welcome to what we call the carbon culture. When we combine it with honoring that drop of rain and a focus on local ecology, we are co-creating abundance for all beings. What if this one acre median were reimagined as a functioning, living system rather than an island cut off? We could pull that poisonous raindrop into this space, move it through rain gardens and soil that have been enriched, enriched by materials that would either end up, end up in a landfill or burned and back in the atmosphere. When this island becomes a sponge that can support the local biodiversity of plants, wildlife, microbes, and more, it becomes a functioning, resilient part of the whole. All the while, this is, we build this with the community because people are the catalyst, and we have a stake in this work, and we can pass it on. Nature has shown us that collaboration is the most efficient way to thrive. Being in community is how life works. We cannot afford to deny this or avoid it any longer. Reimagining our relationship to the land and co-creating with the communities above and below ground benefits us all. This can be a naturally occurring practice if we choose to support it. We are building a new model of landscape design and lifestyle that rejects the status quo and challenges the old paradigm. And our clients and collaborators invest in supporting these cycles for them, their communities, and the earth systems we're all a part of. They also happen to receive beautiful gardens that remind them of their impact on a daily basis. It's so simple, from leaving your leaves to a log in the landscape, to reimagining sponge-like cities, resilient cities, functioning, as a living organism. Some of you may be thinking, I'm not planting a new garden, so how do we optimize what we do have? Or how do we reimagine both our relationship to the land and our personal impacts on the land? Stepping into possibility could start with simply washing dishes in a bowl and using that water to water your plants. The question in most of your minds is, what about the soap? Won't that be bad for the soil? Our response to you is, what kind of soap are you using that would normally be sent down the drain only to be uh, remediated at, at some reclamation plant downstream? The answer is, we have, the answer that we have for you is, choose, choose better soap. You know, and what an awesome way to think about this, that this question, it got us thinking about our impact almost immediately. It's powerful. Imagine if we went to the, before we went to the grocery store, there were a series of mental preparations we could take before we even made our grocery list. Now we're headed down the rabbit hole a little bit to un uncover how much we are surrounded with extractive, toxic, and disruptive matter that we think we need. So we reimagine what we could be doing and we start somehow. Another possibility would be to start with simply refusing unnecessary plastic in our lives. Plastic is a byproduct of the fossil fuel industry. Getting to the root of and separating from this industry is one of the most difficult hurdles. Is it possible to stop specific behaviors and start better ones somehow? We think so. The sooner the better and easier it will be. We believe we can do this when we can get past an even bigger hurdle. So this is where we witness the transformation. Plants, wildlife, and watersheds do not adhere to geopolitical or property line boundaries. We are stuck in place in a, the age of separation, a dualistic paradigm. It has been either us or nature, controlling or disrupting or standing by and observing, us or them. We've been taking from it, controlling a resource that is abundant and generous for too long. How do we interrupt that destructive cycle? It's so simple, mindfulness and care. 
what would it take for us to understand how important this is, and do we, do we care enough to change our behaviors? He's reasoned enough for me. What if we blurred that line of separation, made it an and, and merged those sides into I am reciprocating, co-creating, and in relationship with these naturally occurring systems? Human behavior is causing excessive emissions and the exhaustion of our finite resources. And our behaviors are driven by our beliefs and values. So here we are at our biggest hurdle, the core of the problem. It's not climate change. Let's get something very clear. Climate change is not doing this to us. We can no more reverse climate change than we can turn back time. An attempt to beat climate change is yet another forceful, controlling, misguided, us versus it paradigm that does not meet the reality of the laws of the natural world. The heart of the problem is right here, the human mindset, the individual stew of beliefs and values that we've collected and held on to our whole lives. These are made up the, of the messages that we received from our parents, our, our communities, and our cultures that all shaped us and those who came before us. So at any moment, we can choose to upgrade those inherited, antiquated beliefs and values and switch them out for better ones. And it's not easy, but it is worth starting. Trying for zero to 100% is not also a part of that du dualistic paradigm. Anywhere in between is great, but it takes the same amount of effort to dream of 5% as it does 95%. So this is no easy task, or could it be? It all comes down to choice. Identifying what really matters to you. For me, it's life, my son's life, the life of future generations. I choose to start from there. And even if it's not our fault, it is our responsibility. We're all too often the hardest on ourselves, which breeds judgment and discrimination for and from others. And this is a huge distraction. As we move forward with each mindful thought and considered action, please remember softness, that you are precious cargo, that I'm precious cargo first and foremost, and everybody that I come in contact with is also precious cargo. And I personally have to remem mem remember softness on myself as well as everybody else. So back to mindfulness and care. As humans, we're all, always seeking, we're all seeking quality of life, but I can't help but ask, quality of life for whom? Who benefits when we strip the earth and plant a water-thirsty lawn or pour some concrete, lay down gravel mulch because it looks clean? We don't realize the negative impact we are having on the underground community of roots in the soil food web that make up for 95% of all terrestrial life on the planet. There is quality of life when we care for life. So Beyond Design is Pollyanna, our nonprofit. This is how we engage communities, pass on this knowledge and these practices, and help our communities inspire others. Because it works. Because we, the people, are the catalyst. We can, together, support this mission for life. To manifest change, we have to participate, work together, even get dirty. We support one another so we can support this precious world. Even the simple act of washing dishes in a bowl or refusing to submit to a plastic covered everything to turning our paper discards into soil to jumpstart soil biology. The simple act of reusing cardboard or takeout containers, a potential form of energy and transforming it into active energy to support living systems. That's really, truly awesome. What you're seeing here is a mycorrhizal fungi colonizing the cardboard you saw in the previous image. These habits and practices will support regenerative cycles and proliferate life, well-being, and abundance for you, for us, for all other beings. Imagine starting here. It seems too simple. It is that simple. Even this dead tree still has life in it. That cardboard, this shirt, this, not maybe this not this not shirt, this <laughs> still has something to offer. 
Can we imagine landscapes that actively capture, store, use, and pass on these embodied energies rather than lock them up in a form that disrupts and diminishes life or ending up in a landfill? One more time. Take a breath with me. Receive that oxygen, that gift. Hold it. Embody it and let it nourish you. And when you're ready to let go, right there, that was it. The moment you let go and returned it to the earth, as you breathe without even trying, that is when you pass it on. You already embody the catalyst to a multiplicity of possibilities. We manifest change when we pass it on. Be willing to support the systems that so beautifully support us. Let's start by honoring that breath that single drop of rain, and our future generations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to make a quick announcement uh, that, uh, like, I, like we said, we're a landscape design, architectural design studio, and we have our nonprofit, and we have a lot of upcoming events um, when we go outside there, I'll have a couple of these signs. For those of you who are super tech savvy and know how to use a QR code, you can get on our email list or I'll have a sign-in sheet. But if you're interested in learning more about us, our process, and uh, some of the events where you can be involved and learn how to do this at your house and do it with your community, we've got a whole lot on the horizon coming and we'll have some opportunities for you to connect with us. We have some juicy garden advice that comes out in our twice a month newsletter, yeah. book recommendations, and all kinds of good things to share with your communities as well as ours. Do you mind if we get a photo with all of you? Real quick. Thank you. Okay. We're going to capture, store, and then we'll release We're going to pass this on for <laughs> sure. Thank you so much. Everybody say hi. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, much. thank you, thank you. So we're glad to take questions. There should be microphones available. I, I have one to start off with. Yes. Um, I remember this from my landscaping days. What about maintenance? So, oh. you know, you, you, it's, it's beautiful and really appealing, but I, our customers always ask, how hard is this to maintain? And it's, for, so could you speak a little bit to the maintenance? Part? Absolutely. So this is something that, um, that uh, we start thinking about early on. And you know, what is standard maintenance? Someone comes once a week, they mow, they blow, they clip, they hedge, and it's all sterilized. In this case, we set up these self-complicating systems, self-supporting systems, and uh, the, the maintenance then becomes different. So we work with teams that come in once every two weeks, sometimes once a month, or for four hours every three or four months, something like that. It all depends on the garden. When it comes to the rainwater harvesting system, sometimes the inlets and outlets need to be cleaned out. But these are pretty wild naturalistic gardens that need sometimes just seasonal maintenance, like a full day of maintenance. So it's just, it's not less or more maintenance, it's different. It's certainly less. I mean, I'll... I'll it's, it's much less yeah. than, than uh, a regular garden. It also much fewer resources. The water is reduced enormously. Um, we have work with our clients to wean their gardens off of water at all. We, of course, with new plants, we have to water them, but we, they're native plants. The garden with the big cisterns that you saw in there, the client just called me after these big rains and said, when can I turn off my irrigation? And she was already watering uh, once every three weeks. And she's ready to turn off the irrigation and see how tough her garden is. Oh, thank you. I was just wondering if you had any specific um, plant favorites or even like plant palette favorites that you like to oh use for God. landscaping. Oh. We've been here all night. <laughs> We're nerds. You We've don't want to get us showing. I do, though. I do. Sage. Yeah. <laughs> native plants, right? Hyper local native plants. Um, one ground cover that I love is the Bruce Dickinson buckwheat. 
It's, no. it's uh, less than a foot tall and gets 10 feet wide. It's beautiful and green. I think it's pretty lush looking for a native plant. So come see us after or reach yes. out. I mean, we'll talk plants. We can talk plants. Spiralsia. Yeah. Whoa, gorgeous. And if you've mounded the surface, you know that our flat gardens are artifacts of the lawnmower. If we get away from the lawnmower, we can get a curvaceous, succulent surface plane that actually keeps water from running off, puts it back into the ground. And our native plants need drainage. So if you put a mound and a spiralsia on it, you have a gorgeous cascade of blossoms for months, heavenly. There's a question here. There's a I can barely see. Yeah, it's hard to see. <laughs> so just as a start, we do have a lot of lawn at our house in Anaheim. The clippings go into our brown bin. Can we keep them on property and do something with them? Yes, yes. I mean, <laughs> there you go. If, if you want to get into creating your own mulch or soil, I mean, you've got lawn, so that, that is something I'm not accustomed to doing, but nothing leaves my property in the green bin. Actually, I store uh, waste and trash for our next uh, workshop that we're going to turn into soil. Um, and we, we clip everything and we just leave it on site. And um, that just feeds more soil, and you should see the amount of seedlings that are coming up in the garden. And her it's, garden has been... It's, it's ludicrous. Yeah. Uh, I have, I have three quarters of an acre and no lawn left at all. I had people worry, but what about your grandchildren? My grandchildren invent games to play on that. They mulch ball. Who ever heard of mulch ball? But they run through, they hit a chunk of mulch, a little piece of wood, and then run until the other one catches them. They've adapted. We frequently hear, but my dog needs the lawn. We say, oh, OK. So one of my clients, our clients, we slowly removed their lawn over several years until they had one patch of lawn left for the little muffins. And I desperate call, can you leave? Can you come over? We can't find where the dogs are pooping. I was like, uh, not on the lawn? <laughs> not on the lawn we've been keeping for them? No. I said, well, you know that mulch? that you were worried about? They seem to like that mulch better than they like the lawn. And you can then take that to the compost pile as long as you're not growing food. And you can compost that doggy waste and that little bit of mulch. There's a whole paradigm shift that takes place when we look at gardens differently than what we've been trained to do. One here. I, uh, Can't hear you. Do we have a mic? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he, he's on his way. And then we have another one down here. We'll get you a mic. Or run over there and listen. <laughs> this is one theater you don't want to run in <laughs> up here. I do have a garden that I'm trying to make um, as much uh, w water resistant or water tolerant plants as possible. I don't know if they're all native, but I'm pulling a lot of weeds out, especially this year. And I'm uh, concerned about turning those into mulch because then I'll just have more weeds. I do this constantly. The trick is to get them before they go to seed and I drop them right back down on the ground and it's all free mulch. It may not look the prettiest, but it eventually turns into soil. But I do it constantly. So if you've got some of those grasses, those pernicious grasses popping up, um, see if you can like okay. cut the, the seeds off into the green bin and then put those other ones back on the ground. But it's that seed load. You want to get them early as they start to sprout, starting in February, January and February is when they really start to sprout up. And that's when I catch them. We call that chop and drop. Yeah. And um, it, what it does is it creates a base. You can put mulch over the top of it, or it will just break down. 
but when it rains, our gardens swell and are spongy, and it's out there like walking on bouncing something. It's delightful, and it holds water for a long time. There was a question. Howdy. Oh. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Sorry, I've had the mic. Um, these are labor-intensive projects, right? They are what? These are labor-intensive projects that you're doing, correct? I think any project would be labor-intensive. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, the beauty of this, like some of those community projects, getting the community together is really helpful. Okay, so most of the labor force is community volunteers. Like, where are you sourcing for, like, private homes? Both. We have our contractors take care of some of it. And then sometimes we hold workshops and have the community come together and do it. And we do that both in our own projects and with the city of Pasadena. Yeah. And it has now become a model where we are training other agencies besides Water and Power to do that open source education workshop. So the more people you have participate, the more stakeholders you have who are concerned with the long-term outcome of any project. So if you have a workshop in your front yard, removing your lawn, lasagna mulching, uh, contouring, doing those things, everyone is invested in your garden being a success. So if I walked past your house, I wouldn't feel bad pulling those grasses out <laughs> when they start up in the springtime. There was a question in here. Yes. Okay. Right here. There she is, see. right here. I can't see. <laughs> well, it turns out we planted the wrong trees a long time ago, so we're having some trees taken out. And I would like to keep some uh, shade cover. Do you recommend um, any particular type of tree as being um, better for the environment than another? Where are you located? Uh, Westminster, Orange County. Um, well, I, I always go for oaks, but you'll, it'll be 100 years before you get, <laughs> get the shape you want. Um, uh, that's a tricky oh, one, so. Everything is site specific. Yeah. So uh, right off the top of our heads, we think of red buds, our native trees. But that's not much of a shade tree, but a sycamore, if you, you know, got some moist, because they like riparian moist conditions, the native sycamore, it, um, it's uh, um, deciduous. So in the summertime, you get, um, in the, the summertime you get shade, and in the wintertime, you get warmth. So sycamores are fabulous trees. So, but it all depends on the space you have. Yeah. Sycamores get massive. Yeah. Right over there. I'm just gonna listen until someone talks. Right I over there. I see a hand up there. I have a, a sweater. And over here. I have a microphone. So. Hi. I've lived in a house. I've owned single-family homes and right down the yards, water-wise, bugs and insect friendly. Great. And uh, but now I live in a condo building and our neighbors are working together to make it a habitat garden but I'm wondering living in Long Beach here there's a lot of multifamily homes do you work with communities or with multifamily homes existing instead of new builds to help them convert their concrete jungle into a more water friendly eco-friendly yards I would take that one because uh, I did an eight unit condo building uh, with our techniques and methods um, in Los Angeles in the Eagle Rock area. And that eight unit building, all the uh, owners agreed to do this. They all participated, some watching, some taking photographs, some taking notes, some cleaning cardboard, some moving mulch and we changed the flat, unappealing garden that was there into a native habitat. The children in the uh, complex have grown up over the last five years with that garden, and their school projects reflect what they've learned. They are so excited with what has happened on their property that they have a guerrilla movement, and they go out and find um, parkways 
that are filled with weeds and trash. They lasagna mulch that. They plant wildflowers. And they send me pictures of these emergent flowers on what was a junk covered corner. And that empowerment of and passing it on is something we see in virtually every workshop we do. Last question. Mine is kind of similar to that. How do you work with strict homeowners associations or neighborhoods or even condos where they're very against that and only want a lawn? Um, is it usually from the residents up or are you able to convince management or is, how, how does that work and how can we see more change personally in a place where I just got a lot of I got a lawn removed and then all uh, concrete gravel in well, place. <laughs> our water costs are going up and are going to continue to go up as our infrastructure of bringing water from five states away is breaking down. Uh, coming from Owens Lake, we've had the first breach in that system during these rains that wiped out the system at Olancha. And the cost of that is going to be driving up our uh, water costs dramatically. So cost is how you get to your homeowners association first. Uh, secondly, have a look at uh, Mark Lakeman's book on placemaking and how to bring your community together and discuss the benefits and how everybody in that community gets what they want from what you're planning. What you're seeing here are not just native gardens or just water harvesting gardens or just soil building gardens. We focus on a whole systems approach. So um, piecing together the, um, the, the, the fundamentals of uh, the raw materials of life, soil, water, and carbon, and we bring them together messily and they create, not, they, they create their own self-complicating systems. The nature almost takes care of itself, right? And the benefits uh, range from reduced heat island effect to water conservation and optimization to, to uh, more beautiful spaces and habitat and biodiversity enhancement. So uh, when we think about everything as a whole system, as a part of the energy cycle, that's when we uh, really connect the dots and are able to transform. Ryan. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sort of embarrassed by the gardens I used to. Oh, yeah. But anyways, um, so afterwards, you, when you exit, you go out down here, and out outside there, there's conversation, drinks, and some arts and craft. And then when you leave for the evening, instead of going out through the the main hall, you go out the Pacific Visions, um, the theater exit. I do want to talk about next first Wednesday. Today it was about nature and collaboration. Next first Wednesday is about nature and red tooth and claw. It's Chris Lowe talking about sharks, mm. but there's a special treat. And Chris Lowe from Long Beach is um, a terrific scientist, one of the world's best scientists when it comes to sharks. But it's also sponsored by Onyx Wines, which is from Steve and Brenda Olson. So if you come to that, there'll be some free good wine for everybody that shows up. All right, thank you very much, and have a conversation about your gardens. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah.